Do you all believe as a race, I'm not talking about you specifically, but do you believe as a race, African-Americans, we play the victim? Hey, man. I have a dream. so serious right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yo, if you can just say your name uh, and what you do, and we'll just go down that way and come down this way. Cool. Uh, my name is Joel. I am 28 years old. I work uh, for a fitness company called D1. My name is Mignon Francois, and I'm old enough to be Joel's mother. <laughs> 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 I am the founder and CEO of a cupcake brand, The Cupcake Collection. And uh, I'm Ricky Fletcher, I'm 29, and I do business development for a healthcare IT company here in Nashville. I am Tasha Andrews, I'm 34 years old, and I am an HBCU administrator. My name is Sean Davis, I'm a man of a certain age. I'm a restaurateur and owner of the brand Big Shakes Hot Chicken. My name is Simone Park, and I'm the owner of Heart for Hair Salon. Uh, my name is Christian. I'm 30 years old. Uh, I'm full-time in ministry uh, as a youth leader and a creative director and a uh, kingdom builder. I love it. I love it. So let's get straight into it. Um, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say one word, and you can only give me a response in four words. What does wealth mean to you? Uh, family, health. Um, spirituality, and money. Stability. Um, I can put it in these words. Um, family. Um, paying your bills on time. Um, <laughs> generational uh, <laughs> pass-throughs to your kids, right? Um, wealth means just freedom. That's it. Lender, not the borrower. That's a good one. That was really good. For me, it's the ability to decide. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I think independence, the ability to decide, to do what you want to do, create what you want to do, uh, really live out your own ideas. Love it. Um, when I hear the word wealth, I think about wisdom, success, family, and education. I love it. I love it. One more. Let's go deep. Them was a deep. <laughs> 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 now we're going deep. Let's go deep. Let's go deep. And anyone can, anyone can take this. Anyone can take this. When you think of this word in four words or less, what does it mean to you? Privilege. Mm. <sighs> I think uh, white. I think American. Uh, I think rich. Uh, and entitled. Definitely a feeling of empowerment was not deserved. Definitely a feeling of uh, being in control of the unknown and just knowing that you are, you know, uh, <laughs> cannot be touched in a way. Um, white is another word that comes to mind. Um, supremacy, a whole lot of words, but, you know, just that feeling of being powerful. Anybody else? Yeah, I would say uh, White America Silver Spoon mm. would be uh, the four words that, that I would choose to describe privilege. <laughs> Why you look like that? <laughs> Me? Yeah. Um, because I just didn't see it in that way. The first <laughs> thing I thought when you said privilege was it's one of two things. It's either... For me, it's that's who I am. Mm. Yeah. I am privileged. Mm. Um, sometimes I think we want to take on a sort of secular view of what it means to be privileged. And we're so concerned with what has happened to us instead of what has happened for us. Mm -hmm. I think that for me, there's nothing that I can't do. There's nothing 
that's impossible for me. So for me, when I stand and look at myself in the mirror, I say I am privileged. Expanding on that a little bit, you said white, you said white, you said white. Uh, what's your thoughts with what she said? Does that change the context? Do you see or what's your response to? It doesn't change the context, it doesn't change what I said because that's the first thing that came to my mind. Right. So I, I've been through a lot in my life, whether it be negative or positive, so I've seen a lot of different things. So I totally get and I truly um, believe that and understand that that's the way she believes. But the first, you asked the first thing that came to my mind. Right. That's what I said. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I would I would piggyback on that. I don't think the two things, I agree with her. I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive. I, like he said, it's the first thing that came to my mind, so I was just speaking honestly. Uh, and also, uh, while I do feel that all things are possible for me and that I can achieve anything I put my mind to, that doesn't mean that there doesn't exist a privilege outside of that. Like, you know what I mean? Just because I am capable of achieving anything that I want to achieve doesn't mean that it's not easier for another race. You know what I mean? I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I guess when I said I am privileged, I wasn't taking it from the standpoint of what it means to be a Black woman. I understand privilege as a fair-skinned Black woman. For sure. You know? Absolutely. I have a, I'm a privileged, light-skinned, green-eyed Black woman. You know what I mean? I Double think deuce. That, yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, so yeah. it, it, it's from the perspective, yeah. you know, yeah. that you look. And so when I hear the word, the first thing for me doesn't come to that. Yeah. You know, and that's that's what I was trying. And I, I agree with you because I even understand privilege as a man versus mm -hmm. you as a woman. Mm -hmm. I understand. Correct. And that's why my first two words were white and then American because I think it's layers to it. Mm -hmm. I think as yeah. Americans, we're privileged. Yeah. I don't think it just stops. At, I think it's layers to it as you go throughout socioeconomic constructs. Than race, no yeah, problem. I think it's deeper than race, but uh, yeah. I, I agree with what you're saying. It's different levels to it, so mm -hmm. I, I agree with that for sure. And I think your life experiences create the paradigm by which you see that through. Mm -hmm. It yeah. really depends on, you know, some of the things that you've experienced personally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we all have our life experiences that have shaped who we are and how we think and how we see things. And I think that would be different for every person, every American, every oh. woman. Because, you know, bringing up those differences, we have so many differences within our culture yeah. Yeah. Um, that help us see things a certain way. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. And yeah. the biggest reason I didn't attach color or race to privilege is because I feel like the biggest advantage I have uh, and the biggest privilege I've had is my dad. And he, it's not like he was rich. He was a blue-collar man. But... He gave me all the support and guidance and love that I needed. And I look at some of my peers and some of my family members that didn't turn out the way they wanted to. And the, the biggest difference is my dad stuck around. Mm -hmm. And I didn't earn that, dad. I was born into it. Not everyone has that. Like you said, culturally, it's, it's, it's different. And yeah. I know I wouldn't be where I was today without him. So mm -hmm. I feel like I was privileged in that way. Mm -hmm. When we think about African-Americans today, do you think as a culture, we are in a healthy place? Are we in a healthy place when it comes to finances, when it comes to relationship, when it comes to parenting, when it comes to careers, uh, when it comes to freedom, when it comes to uh, racism? Are we, in a, are we in a healthy place? I think, with, I think we're going in the right direction. Yeah. I think there's a lot of positive things that are being seen, right? I also think that there's a lot of work that could be done. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll say that for now. But. Yeah. So, and I'm with you. I think it's I think it's progressing. I think we be, we're better than we were yesterday, and not yesterday, literally yesterday, but a generation ago. I think as far as education, I, I don't have stats, but I'm sure education level, uh, graduation rates, and even income level has raised in these last 20 years um, from the regression we've made as a black community. Personally, I still think we have a, a while to go, a long way to go, and I say that uh, based on my personal experiences growing up being, you know, one of few black kids in, in my neighborhood, in my school, even at my job now, what I do now, I'm the only black guy on my team. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm sure it, I, I would assume it's the same for you too. So you are seeing more black executives and CEOs and uh, people in, in positions of power, but it's, I mean, even just today, I'm, I'm watching ESPN. There's four NFL head coaches that are black. I'm still not seeing I'm still not seeing us rise to the potential that I think we as a people 
should be able to rise to. Correct. Right. I'll I'll agree with you, bro. Like I, I I'll I'll jump out there and agree with you. I think uh, to a great degree, uh, our culture is has been trained to just maintain and live in a post traumatic state. Mm. Um, I think yes. Uh, instead of I think instead of a lot of our issues being solved, we're being um, uh, trained and distracted to just be desensitized by them and, and focus on other minuscule things. Um, so it may seem like progress when really uh, it, it's just um, an increased level of uh, uh, ignorance to a degree um, because uh, there's an illusion uh, of equality, but when you really look at the constructs of, yeah. and the statistics of how things level out, um, I think we're, we're just trained to remain in a post-traumatic state and um, kind of so, just deal with it. As, as far as that, like, that trained or conditioning, my, it's funny because my mom used to hate the show Good Times, so she wouldn't let me watch it. I was like, watch. She's like, because I hate the fact that they say keeping her head above water. We're not thriving. She's like, you need to watch The Cosby's or something like that where it shows a black family thriving as opposed to keeping your head above water. Mm. Um, so, and, and that's part of the, like, Hey, that that was made for black people just yeah. to show our conditions, but and they, they didn't get better. I don't think they moved on it's up. It's like being intellectually disabled, right? Yeah, yep. you know, and 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 stagnant. First off, I think education, mm. right? You know, you have situations in you know, black communities, white communities, whatever. The fact of the problem there's not enough tax-paying individuals in those underprivileged areas. So that's why the education is not there, the teachers are not there, the books are not there. So it's definitely still a huge disadvantage for individuals coming up and trying to be that success, right? That success yeah. story. So we got to work harder. Got to work harder. When we look at the African American culture um, and the African American communities, do y'all feel as if the education is the same compared to white communities? And do you feel as if uh, financial education is being taught in our community? not just in the high schools, but in the community in general as a culture? Wow. I, my, personally, myself, you know, I grew up with two loving parents, right? They were entrepreneurs, right? And um, I watched them. I watched them hustle. So I learned from them, right? My peers didn't have that. My peers didn't have a dad. My peers were out the street hustling. They were doing whatever they were doing, but they didn't have that. Just really um, having that support and understanding of what it meant to be fiscal educated, you know, how to get a bank account, how to write a check. Nah, nah, that wasn't there. So it's kind of hard to succeed when you don't know the basics about financial literacy. Yeah, and as far as fina uh, financial literacy, just, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is black people haven't had that much experience with finance in general to educate the, the past generation. You think about it, a lot of our, our parents came up uh, I mean, my dad was a working class guy, so we, we were never just having to manage wealth because there wasn't wealth there. So uh, I think as it, we progress uh, as a race and a society, hopefully we can catch up and there will be those chances to, to educate our kids about financial literacy. But a lot of us just didn't have the, the finances to educate people on. It's so interesting because that question, I don't think that's a, a race question. Mm. I really don't. We, I, I had all the resources in the world growing up from an educational standpoint, but, and, I, and I've talked to you about this, you, we don't learn about finances in school. At least I didn't. Like, nobody taught us how to open up a bank account, write a check, balance a checkbook. I don't even know if people still do that today, but <laughs> no, that's like in schools in general. It's not even the- Yeah, right. Yeah. Man, I just right. hired a tax dude today because I didn't know what I was doing. Right. So, so, but he was asking, like, in the, the black community, as far as, like, your, your family members teaching about that financial liter literacy as opposed to a school, school systems. I went to a, a white school, too. They didn't, they're not going to So, I, yeah, I understood that as, as school oh. systems. But as it pertains to the school system, I, it, there's not enough education on, on, on financial literacy. I don't want to put her on the spot, but I'd like to hear from Tasha. She's an educator at an <laughs> HBCU. Yeah, that's I, it. I don't know if anybody's more qualified to speak on this thing. I agree. Um... It's kind of twofold. So in, in part, from a professional standpoint, it makes me very sad. Um, we have students who you can tell they know nothing about finance, um, no financial literacy whatsoever. Um, they barely know how to complete their financial aid request to get into school. Mm -hmm. And then once they get there, you think you have to max out your student loans just to take care of yourself. 
Because if something happens in these nine months that you're away at school, you can't call home and get any money. So you max out as much as you can borrow because you think you got to have it stored up to take care of yourself. And it's sad. It's heartbreaking because then they leave that. I mean, you know, you've written a book on it. Their interest goes up and all that. And then you spend the rest of your um, professional life trying to pay for the profession. And mm. it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, but on the, the other side of that, um, I think about my own personal story. I think um, sometimes you carry the weight on your shoulders because you're the difference maker. I'm the oldest of four children, and my parents did not teach us much about money. I thought, you know, everything I, I brought home, I had to put on my back or on my feet. I just thought that's that's what that's how you show that you have money. And once I realized those mistakes, because I was in debt and because I was trying to put myself through college, I had to reach back and teach my siblings. Yeah. So even to the point that as an adult, we have gotten together as four children and said, okay, whose credit are we fixing next? Mm -hmm. Everybody take their money, let's, you know, what it, how, mu how much in debt are you? And we fix it as a family. Mm, and once we taught ourselves that, um, I think that's something that will create generational wealth exactly. because it took one person going off to school, messing exactly. up, realizing I can teach my own family this. So if the educational system doesn't teach me, if my parents didn't know to teach me, if the community doesn't teach me, I can teach myself, and then I'm going to teach the people that I love. Yeah, and that becomes exactly. a personal responsibility. That's right. Amen. Great response. Great. <laughs> Great response. Do you all believe as a race, I'm not talking about you specifically, but do you believe as a race, African Americans, we play the victim? Hey, man. I have a dream. Um, no. I'm just going to leave that as a one word answer. I'm not even going to jump in deeper than that. No. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm on the side of absolutely not. And I will and I will I will leave it there until somebody disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then I'll jump back in. And now I'm gonna step yeah. out. Well, you know, I mean, I'm gonna be real. I'm gonna say yes. Let's go. <laughs> I'm gonna be real. I'm 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 gonna say I, I'm gonna say yes. I um give me an wow. example. See, it's a loaded question just because I can't, I'm not gonna sit here and say every single African American sides either on the yes side or on the no side. Mm -hmm. uh, I say yes to mainly spark conversation, but also uh, I know you're not talking, you said not personal experiences, but that's all I got to go on. I will say, uh, you know, just based on where I am in life, I've gotten a lot of pressure from African Americans. Um, feeling like, you know, I've gotten to where I am because of white people or I, I you can't speak, you, you didn't grow up like I did. Like I, I came from the hood, you know, I didn't have the same opportunities and privileges that other people had. And though, you know, I, I believe that to be true, <clears throat> I in today's America, I really do feel like anybody has the opportunity to rise to the occasion. Now, is it easier for certain people over others? Yeah, I mean, let's be real, yes. Like, that's 100% true. But, you know, to, to I, I just keep hearing, like, systemic oppression, this, that, and the third. Like, yeah, we get it, I know. Like, we all know. Like, we all know. But the opportunities are still there. Will you have to work a little bit harder to get to where you want to be? Absolutely. Because of how you look? Absolutely. I'm a testament of it. Um, anybody gonna say nothing? Go ahead. I'm, hey, I, I want to hear this. Um, I, I think it's I think it's impossible to accuse us of playing the victim. Um, you're talking about a 400 plus year head start for a particular uh, set of people. You're talking about systematic oppression. That's what I meant by a post-traumatic state. Is we're tr we're we're at this stage in 2020. We're trained to say, yeah, it's unequal, but and that's. That's just not okay to me. Um, I, I don't think we should ever get to the place where we just accept inequality. Correct. Uh, it, it, I, I'm, not, I'm not encouraging stagnation, so I agree with you. I'm not encouraging throwing in the towel like, yo, it's not fair. That's not what I'm saying at all. But while striving to be your best self, you should never accept inequality. And I think that's what yeah, we're right. being trained to kind of just be like, yo, this is just the way it is, and, and to no longer call it out. And 
I, I'm not even saying we got to go pick it, protest. I, yeah. I'm not saying none of that. But at least in conversations like this, if we're not going to set a standard, no standard is going to be set. No, yeah. no st nobody else is going to stand it. Nobody else is going to set it. You're talking about, uh, I mean, statistically, like factually speaking, uh, at the at the onset of of this of the of the of the twentieth century, you're talking about land on, owners only giving land to specific races. That's generational wealth. Yeah. You're talking about bank loans only be, being given right, to right. specific races. How can that, you? That's up? generational wealth. Right. So we we can't. It, it, it's not even like this is ancient history. That, but he that's didn't what, say. That's what blows my mind. This is recent history. But he didn't say that that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. What he said was, do we play the victim? Mm -hmm. And I think there is, that is, that's very different. You're aware of the things that have happened, but are you victimized as a result of it? So, do you say, this is what I can do with what I have been allotted or, or whatever my place in life is? Are we playing the victim is the question. So I yes, think we, I think we have, have to define play the victim. Okay. Yeah, I think we are the victim. Because, because anybody, anybody can be a victim. I think we so are. I think we are factually yeah. a victim. Do all races so can what, be victims? So what do we? What do we call in playing the victim? What so do we what, do you, then, that what, as? what do you see that as then? What, what, what do I see what as? Playing the victim, like when when you hear that, like what does what does that trigger for play, you? Play the victim means I'm acting like something is being done to me that's not being done. Or to always me. complaining. That's what I hear. Always complaining about our history. That's what I hear when I hear play the victim. Like you're act, you're, you're you're taking the position that something being done to you and nothing's being done to you. That's somebody playing a victim to me. This is what I and hear. And that's not the case to me. This you know is what, what I, mean? I hear. Yeah. Get over slavery. Stop talking about it. We're all equal now. You should be ahead. Where you should be further than where you're at. Stop talking about the old thing, old days. I'm gonna stop right there. But yeah, that's what so, I. That's that's what it. That's what it triggers in my head. Mm -hmm. So. To say, like, we can't, I don't think you can outrule or, like, just say, hey, we're, some black people aren't playing the victim because people, everyone uses excuses. Correct. And people can be uh, using excuse, play, playing the victim by whatever excuse they may bring. But, but like you said, and like you said, like, we weren't given an opportunity basically to, to build that generational wealth. And without that opportunity, we don't own anything. So we are having to kind of, look for employment like at wherever you work and even you said you have there's one person at d1 that's black there's and we're 15 percent of the nation that's not an accurate representation of america so therefore we may not be playing the victim but we're getting hurt in corporate america or whatever part of life and yeah, that, that's kind of just statistics i'm gonna agree with him um you know I also don't like the term playing the victim because yeah. it does sound like you're alluding to something that is not real. Exactly. And I think mm -hmm. if you, if we, you know, I'm not dismissing or negating the effects of 400 years of oppression sure. and, you know, the things that we've seen and been through. I'm not dismissing any of that. But if we cut it all off and we started with a year ago, we are still being victimized by the stuff you have to see on TV. You have African-American boys who at the age of 11 or 12, all they have ever seen were African-American boys being killed on TV. Mm -hmm. That's all they've ever seen. They've not known the life without it because they've watched this happen since they've been old enough to understand. Mm -hmm. They are victims. You can go into a grocery store. You can go into an amusement park. You can go anywhere and be mistreated, and you will be a victim today. We're not talking about the victimization only of the yesteryears. You can be a victim tomorrow. And I think if we're all honest, we have been in places where you have been the victim. That's right. You were either wrongly accused or wrongly criticized or, or maybe let's not even make it a negative thing. Looked over for a job unjustly. <laughs> There, I, it's happening. So you, uh, yeah. there, there's a, there's a, a rationale to the, the relevancy of still being victimized. Yeah, yeah. And like I was to her point, it's not even like this is ancient history. We're talking about 1960s, 1970s. Like, the, the, the Civil Rights Act was just passed halfway through the 20th century. Like, it's not even hundreds of years ago. Like, there are people alive <laughs> still. Like, you know what I mean? Who, who went through segregation that are still alive. Like, it's not even, of course, of course. you know what I mean? It's not even ancient history. So I, I, I can never agree that the responsibility is on us to fix the mistakes of others. I could never agree with that. I, I just can't. 
And it doesn't take away, you know, something that I said on the back end of my last answer. At some point, as a family, as a community, you can gather the people you love and say, let's get us out of yeah, this. Correct. And then you could say, well, we're no longer playing the victim. We took pride yeah. and took our own responsibility. And then you can build all that up, and tomorrow you can go somewhere and still be disrespected. To that point, when my, in my initial answer to you, I said, I'm not making an excuse for stagnation. Mm -hmm. Like It's not no excuse to be stagnant. Yeah. It's not no ex excuse to not grind and hustle Absolutely. and get out here and get it. But even if his question is about us as a race and as a culture, mm -hmm. and if I pull, if I get my family together and pull my family up, that's my family. Exactly. You feel me? That's that's, right. that's not balancing the scales. That's right. You know and what I'm it's, saying? It's very interesting. Your point is very, very interesting because I could be an extremely successful black man in, to, in today's America and still go somewhere tomorrow and be looked down upon yeah. Yeah, of because so, of what I look like. Yeah. So I was going to ask yeah. you, because I, I remember like Booger T. Washington, like the 1890s, to kind of offset the Jim Crow laws. He was I'm like, saying hey, I'm that old, right? I'm trying, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to give me some You remember him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't go, I didn't go, I didn't go, I didn't go. <laughs> Make sure you know I didn't go to school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, brother. All right. Right. I'm the historian. Right. He, he said basically. Am I great showing that much though, for real? <laughs> To, no, I was going to ask you this. So you said basically to, to offset the, the Jim Crow laws that were put in place, we had to educate and be entrepreneurs. And you, you two have both done that. Yeah. So I'd like to hear your experience, because this is, what, 130 years later for yeah. him saying, hey, we need to mobilize on our own, get education, and be entrepreneurs. Uh, and that will, that will create our own system of wealth. But, I mean, you're only, like you say, you're only one person. It's hard to pull up a whole group. Of course. But, so I like, kind of like to hear y'all's experience as being entrepreneurs. You can talk me in the office. I, I was going to let you go first. Simone owns her own shop, too, so I'd love to hear you. Oh, oh, okay. I'm yeah. taking it in. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just sorry. listening right now. You know? Well, like, like I said, I, I was kind of raised in an entrepreneurial family, right? I was always taught, don't work. I'll just be honest, my father, don't work for the white man. That was it, right? You get education, anything you could take, put it towards your own business. Put your own two feet on the ground. Save your money. You know, get a hustle. You know, he's showing me all these things to do. So it was always in my mind that I had to work for myself. The only way I'm going to come up is to work for myself. So I was never trained to, you know, you're going to get a great education, then you're going to go get a great job, and then you're going to be successful, then you're going to raise a family. Now it was out. Go get your own brand. Raise your family. Give your brand to your family. Mm. Let them continue that generational wealth. So that's the way I was taught. Mm. And that's the way I just, I got to keep it moving. Okay. Okay, so okay. so give me, so re, rephrase the question that you had specifically. Basically, what I was saying is Booker T. Washington said to, to offset any type of segregation or discrimination or from playing the victim, we need to educate uh, and be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Has that experience kind of help you push through and have you been able to, to bring others up because of your entrepreneurship? Okay, so thank you for that question. I definitely believe that entrepreneurship is freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's ultimate freedom. I, I was writing down a thought just yesterday as I was flying through Chicago that one sign of enslavement is a name change that when people say that you're something, that you're not. So if I was to like go and address the same idea with biblical characters, we could look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. That was not their name. Yes. It was their name that they were given in enslavement. And I can just imagine how they were in a room together and, you know, one of them, yelling, hey, Shadrach, dude, that is not my name. I'm Toby. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I feel like, like we have a responsibility to know who we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a responsibility to do our due diligence yeah. to make our mm -hmm. name great. That we, somebody can walk around and call you a liar. Is that yeah. who you are? Yeah. That's not who you are. Somebody can walk around and call you a thief. Is that who you are? That's the name that yeah. the enslavement yeah. has given you, right? And so I think that the only way that we can exercise true freedom is in ownership. 
of our stuff, of ourselves, of our of our actions, of the things that we create, that we can be makers. I think that this is the time for all hustlers mm -hmm. to unite. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that we all can make whatever we want to be a part of, we no longer have to sit back and say, oh, it's because of what you did to me. Listen, I was molested as a child. So if we want to go back and talk about victimization of the things that people have done to us, we can do that. Or we can rise above it and we can say, well, this is who I am now. This mm -hmm. is what I'm going to do. When I started my business, I could not bake not even out of a box. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any credit. I didn't have any experience in the bill, in the business. Nobody was gonna give me a loan for anything. I was losing the house that the very bakery exists in right now, 11 years later. Because when you put your mind, this is what I was saying earlier, we, are, we can be focused on what happened for us yeah. Instead of what has happened to us. I believe that it is that blood running through my veins that had things taken from her. You know, it is that blood running through my veins that said, no, you can't come in here. It was, it's that blood that is running through my veins that made my great grandfather one of the first to be able to do, to sing where he sang. And those are the things that I'm using today to get me from where I am to where it is that I want to be. And it's those things that I'm giving to my children and saying, this is what you have. We're not talking about what we're not. We're talking about what we are. Mm. And I think that's the difference. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about what, what we are, what are we doing right as a culture that's setting up our children to have wealth? What are we doing right as a culture to where our children's children will know our names? Are we doing things right as a culture to change the narrative of our finances of our children? I can only answer that as an individual and then see what we and my wife also tried to do and spread, right? You know, we're all about giving back. We're all about showing and proving. You know, I want to be that beacon that this young brother said, you know what? I want to do what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? I want to go out and get my own wealth. I want to start my own business. And if I wasn't there, maybe he didn't see me. Maybe they never came to my restaurant. Maybe it's just be, you know, but when you're there, we're going to teach you. We're going to give you tools. We're going to teach you about customer service. We're going to teach you how to run a restaurant because that's what we have to do. It's my duty. I have to teach. And again, I can only speak about me. Um, I, can't sa I can't save the world. Yeah. But I can save the people that watch me. I can save the people that touch me. <laughs> I can save the people that work for me. I do my best, right? You know, so, um, you know, I, I just look at it as... Um, you have to be that beacon, right? You got to be that shining light to change everything around you. You know, yeah. be that leading example. But I don't think that's anything new under the sun, what you're saying. No, it's not I, new. I, I think that's, that's what this community has been. You know, it has been a community of people who say, I'll teach you how to do this. What community are you talking about? The black community has gone, I, I have plenty of examples in my life of people who stuck their foot in the door so that I could pass through. Now, and, always, and, that's not always out, out the way we do things, though. I have a dream. You know, I, I'm I just think, gonna, I no. think there's a bigger majority of us that are doing that for one another than, than we are willing to shout from the mountaintops about, yeah. you know, who did something for me. And I think there are plenty of people who worked for that on our behalf to make a way for me. So let, let me ask you guys a question. And like you asked, like if we're doing the right thing uh, as a culture, do you guys think like, as, the, as the black community, we always do too much kind of self-promotion and buying flashy things and, and doing all the stuff that negatively stereotype for us. But, I mean, you got Jordans on uh, right now. You look at the Jewish legacy. They're another historically oppressed people, but the, their type of lineage, like, hey, we're going to save a lot of money and we're going we're gonna to pass it on to our generation. Mm -hmm. So do you think we are progressing in the right way? I think 
what our culture is doing right is that we've always been able to take our pain and channel it into expression. Our, our culture is at the top of every industry. Our culture sure. is manufactured, marketed, and sold at the top of every industry. We are at the top of music. Black culture is pop culture. We, we've always been able, we've always been able to take our pain and channel it into art, into expression, and to even you could give black people the worst part of anything, and they'll find a way to make it amazing. I think it goes back to her point about ownership. We don't own the we don't own the culture that we create, mm -hmm. and I think that's the issue. Yeah. But what we are doing right is that we always have the most creative, most artistic. Uh, uh, most true expression of whatever industry we're in. And the issue is that we don't own it. We're not the one signing the checks. Mm. So that goes back into your point where because we're not the one signing the checks, it goes to her point where we're trying to look like the one who's signing the checks even yeah. though we're not. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to have this, the symbols of success without actually being successful. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Jewish community, exactly. community has been able that's to right. do. They own things, so they don't have time to look like they own it because they actually own it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, but I do want to give us credit for, to answer your question, what are we doing, right? We are the needle of culture. Oh, yeah. Period. We're the founders. Like, and, and we're the foundation. On Earth. On Earth. And right that's off. something I feel like we're doing right. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that's something I feel like we're I doing right. I think you both brought up a point, though, that further speaks to our internal oppression because I only hear other Black people say things about us wearing Jordans and, yeah. you know, we're driving mm -hmm. this. You don't say that to your neighbor. You don't know how much he paid for, you mm -hmm. know, whatever shoes he wears. I actually right? got these for free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these were a gift. No, no, no. no. It's, it's something that's said all the time. It's something yeah. that's said all the time, it you is. know, and even myself, I, I've caught myself becoming like that's an internal thing because your counterpart that does not look like you might put on a pair of $250 shoes and not think anything about it. You but see isn't it crazy though? Like, that's a great point, because isn't it crazy? Like, you look at uh, a black person that dresses really well, or they 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 come out of like a Mercedes or something. My mind automatically goes to like, dang, like, how do you get that? But why? Mm -hmm. To your point. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's like, I feel like you know why. I feel like you know why. It's a part of the internal oppression. It's, I feel like you know why. But then if a white person walks out, it's yeah. institutionalized it's the, the thing internal oppression. And always say what they expect you to be. And it's sad. You know, I was, I was talking to the young brothers, you know, why do you mean mug each other when you're walking towards each other, coming down the block? You're in the mall. Why don't you say, hey, peace, brother, how you doing? Yeah. Why is it always, hey, how you doing? That's how we, a relationship starts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how we break down that mechanism of hatred exactly. amongst us. Yeah. Why are these brothers killing each other? They are trained to hate each other. First again, they're trained again, to hate. I think that no. depends on where you are. It, de it depends I, I've been where to, you I've are. I've been in several white spaces where if I walk in and there's another black person anywhere within I view, you almost like, like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I, I don't again, see the mean is that? mugging thing. Like, if I'm in I'm a, a black white man. space, I... Even, with, even among way. black men. I yeah. see black men dap each other up in a mall because they pass each other and they see they're the only ones oh, yeah. around. And they will That's speak true. to each other. They will embrace each other. Yeah. I haven't seen that. I'm sorry, but oh, man, I really? appreciate you. Really? I haven't seen that. No, I, no, I'm, I think, I'm a grown man is. now. I'm talking, no, about, I'm, talking, I'm talking about years later. I'm a grown man. I don't have those issues now. You. Every yeah. brother that comes towards me is, how you doing, brother? How yeah. you doing, young man? Yeah. I'm talking about the young kids, yeah. right? Yeah. That are walking around each other and not understanding who the other person is. I really feel like black people root for each other. I yeah. really yeah. do. I believe that, too. I mean, man, you look on TV and you watching Bowling or something on ESPN, like, I'm sorry, I'm going for the one black dude that's out there. <laughs> Everybody roots for the black I'm, 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 I'm voting. I want him. Like, I want him to win and I want him to be exactly. successful in anything that he does. Exactly. Yeah. But would you, but, but, and I, I'm just devil's advocate because I'm with you. Would you support the black person who's starting the first black bowling league? Yeah. yeah. What's the difference? I was trying to learn how like, to Like, that's the difference, is that all of these industries that we're supporting, we don't we don't own the other. Exactly. Like, all, we, we push the needle in billion-dollar industries and don't... You talk about head coaches. Mm -hmm. There's one black NBA owner. We we run the NBA, yeah. but there's one owner. Mm -hmm. Like, if a black league started today, would you watch it? That's the real question. Mm -hmm. And do we support our black schools? We support Nice Cube. Come on. Y'all um, was calling out Jordans and... Y'all know I'm a money guy, so studies are showing 
that by 2054, the average African American will have zero to negative wealth, when the average Caucasian will have $150,000 or more. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if studies are showing that we will have zero to negative wealth, but we look like wealth, where are we messing up at? What What is the problem? Ownership. Ownership of your own and ownership and helping people have ownership. There's got to be more teachers out there. There's got to be more teachers and more examples, yeah, right, yeah. of ownership and what it looks yeah. like, to what it point. truly looks like, right? Because like you said, you can have a company, it could be a bunch of black people running around the stage and running around yeah. the courts, but if you don't own nothing, but everybody else got a Benz on the court, exactly. right? The owner might have nothing but a beat-up wa- wagon, but he's a billionaire. But it's teaching, right? You have to be that teaching, that example. But I guess my question is, ownership doesn't stop you from saving what your income is. We're not even saving what we're making. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So studies show that the average Caucasian drives a Ford F-150. Mm. Then the average African-American who makes in between fifty and $60,000 drives a Mercedes. So I, I guess my question is for us, while yes, we don't own a lot, with the income that we do have, why is it that in the next 20 years we will not have wealth? I think, I mean, black people, I, it just goes back to the fact that black people rather look like they have money than actually have money. I and if you don't wanna, think I don't want to look like they have Now, 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 listen, now, now, listen, I say that to say this. Now, look, listen, I say that to say this. Look at Jay, look at Jay Z. Let's look at Jay Z. Turn my chair around on this one, brother. Let's, let, let, let's look at Jay Z real quick. This is, and, and I want to bring, and I was going to bring it up with I'm an listening. example. I'm listening. Come on, brother. Jay Z, when he first got into the rap game, and there, and you can look at yourself on the internet. Man was worth I, a thing. I, like, I was there, so I'm. I'm it was I'm worth about hundred hundred thousand dollars. I just, I just shared that. I shared had that two the, days the chain, ago. Yeah. Four the chain. Had, I don't know how much money and jewelry he had on him. Jay Z worth a bill was wearing just a black t-shirt, a black t-shirt and all that. Like, that, so that's the point I'm trying to make. That's deceptive, that's deceptive, that's deceptive. He's not even wearing black I understand that. It's still deceptive. I guarantee you, I guarantee you the Hugo he had on was 500K. But, 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 but it's, but I'm just saying, but I'm just saying like the flashiness, like the the fact that we feel like we gotta, you know, wear all the chains, the grills, all this stuff to show that you have money and have wealth. When a brother used to get a dime, he'll go out and get a flashy suit and take his old lady out to the club. I mean, that's just, what it was. Yeah. You know, if you don't make a lot of money, if you don't have a lot, yeah, when you get little. that little check, you're going to go out there and try to do what you can do exactly. and stretch it and try to have a good time and show people, hey, I got a job. I'm, I'm, this yeah. is what I'm doing. Okay, so why do but we have to feel like we have to show people that? Because to, his point, to his point, he was asking about saving, right? It's, like, a, it's a mentality shit. I, yeah. I agree. The thing that's coming to my head goes down to fake it till you make it. Mm. Yeah. Where did that even come from? No idea. And if you could trace where fake it till you make it even came from and realize the mentality that that even is, that maybe you wouldn't even do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what it all boils down to. We have been brainwashed into believing that we have to look a certain part to be allowed to come into the conversation and be inside of the room. And be accepted. Yeah. But if if yeah, everything that right. we've said is it's true, true. Yeah. If, if 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 everything, all things are being equal, that are true, then we have a right to be in the room anyway. Regardless, exactly. And, but, and I think that's so. But that's then, us saying that about us. Mm-hmm. You know, I I have to dress conservative conservatively at work. You know, I have to wear business suits. I have to have my nails a certain way, my hair a certain way. On the weekend, I wear a baseball cap turned backwards. <laughs> Um, sweatsuits, sweat Jordans, suits, Jordans uh, you know, and, and I'm perceived very differently. Oh, it's yeah. night and day. Yeah. I can go to Nordstrom's on the weekend just killing time, and if I'm dressed in my weekend attire, I'm perceived a certain way. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I can go to Nordstrom's after work dressed like I'm dressed now after work. Mm-hmm. I'm perceived a completely different way. I'm the same 100%. person. It doesn't... So I get that having to do what you have to do. That's almost a work uniform. You got to do that. You that's work it. at Chick-fil-A, you got to wear a red polo. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's, that's a work uniform. Mm-hmm. It does not have to be that way. And that's why I said earlier that victimization can come in many different forms. And and to his point, we kind of learn to deal with it. 
We mm-hmm. learn to deal with it. You know, I've been followed around the store and I stopped and turned around. And I said, I'm not going to put anything in here in my Tory Burch bag. Mm-hmm. And I look at her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because it's like, I'm not going to steal anything. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you're perceiving me on an outward appearance just because I'm not dressed a certain way and it's unfair. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's really unfair. Yeah. Studies are showing that nearly 50% of us cannot afford to pay cash for a $400 emergency. But yet, I guarantee the same person owns two pair of Jordans that are, that is worth $500. Not all the time. Is it is it also like is it also make a difference that I mean, we get paid black people in general, we get paid about 25% less for the same position. As a, as a white male, as a wild counterpart. Valid that point. has to be, like, it's hard to bridge that gap. Yeah, but he just finished saying we were the needle of the culture, so we set that. We set the culture, yeah. We like, like we buy Jordan, but the white guy owns Michael Jordan. Like, he owns the Jordan brand, so how can we catch up to that? Well, I was saying we get, 20, we get paid 25% less for doing the exact same, for doing the exact same job. But if our spending habits are the way that they are, what does it matter what you're getting paid? Exactly. That's that was the your point. point. Like, like, that's the point. point. It really you're doesn't we're matter. Like, the money we're being, it don't matter. Being fiscally, financially responsible and understanding what that actually means is huge, right? If you're not taught it, don't understand it, then go to school for it, you'll never know it. So to your point, and you're going to be in a negative and not have money in comparison in 2054, being fiscally irresponsible, right? Not knowing how to invest properly, not knowing what to do with that dollar that you got. You know, I I used to, well, I was kind of raised when I was the youngest youngster, and, and I started in the cooking industry. I was raised by an Italian family. And the gentleman always told me, you know, the father always told me, you take that dollar, you spit on it. You put it in the bank and don't look at it until you get enough to invest it, reinvest it. Don't put it in your pocket. If you walk around in your pocket, you're going to spend it. Mm-hmm. That was something he always told me as a youngster, right? And then come from my father. It came from the gentleman I worked for wow. that I lived with. Mm-hmm. And... And again, I'm not saying it was a black thing, I'm not saying it was a white thing or anything, but it was something I just learned from him. And, you know, I, that I think that, you know, it starts at home. You know, the reason why it starts at home, we have to know about what to do with that dollar. If you don't know what to do with the dollar, the dollar's just gonna leave your pocket. And I think those are just a bunch of personal decisions that you have to make as a person yeah. yourself. Mm-hmm. You have to decide. That that's no. not black yeah. or white. Yeah. That's yeah. not that's black or white. I think it's, I think it's a, a decision, even if you are black, yeah. even if you are oppressed, even if you have been victimized, I think you still have to make a decision. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we talk about this often. We drive what we drive by choice. We could go get nicer, newer cars, but we, we've made a mature decision to not feel intimidated when you meet your friends for lunch and everybody's jumping out of a new car and yours is 15 years old. You don't, we, we made a choice mm-hmm. not to be affected by that. We made a choice to think, okay, if we, if we decide to get married, if we don't have this amount of money in the bank, why would we spend that to throw a celebration? Yeah. We're not going to, you know, you have to have those conversations as yeah. individuals. Mm-hmm. And then you, you so make those decisions as families. And, you know, I, I heard someone say not too long ago, you're born looking like your dad, you die looking like your decisions. <laughs> so it's you, it, how, how you leave <laughs> this good. earth is going to be just how you made decisions. I'm about to yeah. use that one. Hey, I'm about to use that as well. I'm about to use that as well. I'm taking that one. That was good. That was good. <laughs> so, so as a... That's good. That's good. How do we help our culture make better decisions with the income that they do have? Because you made a valid point. Yeah. We will make less. Yeah. That's just proven across the table. We cannot control that as of right now. But with the income that we have, I'm a, I'm a saved man. So flipping over to the spiritual side, how do we become good stewards of the resources that God has given us? We live on less than we make. We lead by example. We open the door for transparency to allow other people to see where we actually are instead of telling them what we want them to believe or what we fantasize to be the truth. We actually show them and live out for them by example what it is that they are supposed to do. When my daughter turned 16 years old, I began to prepare her to be a homeowner by the time she was 21. I began to do things that I knew would position her to do that. 
that. So I led her by example. I didn't just talk about what I wanted to be. I was about what I wanted her to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's what we do. We're so busy not wanting to tell our children, oh, mom was a hoe mm. back in the day, but she learned better than that. Mm-hmm. You know, they can see. Right. They're not blind. You know, the the bottom line is, is that we we live by example, in front of our children, whatever, no matter what we say, they see what we do. And I think that's the way we change it. Okay, I will add something here. Um, I, well, when you were talking about that, with the analogy of like when you're on an airplane and the oxygen mask analogy, mm-hmm. how you have to put the mask on yourself first mm-hmm. to, be, to be able to even help the person mm-hmm. put on their mask. Mm-hmm. To me, I'm always big about like, be the very thing that you want to attract and then you can duplicate yourself. Because if you're trying to duplicate something or trying to pour into somebody else and you're not even taking care of yourself, that's kind of hard to do that. Mm-hmm. And then the quote that I love is, know what you know and know who don't... Do, wait, know what you know and... Wait, how's he say? Know what you know and know someone who doesn't know that you know what you know and that's all you need to know. So whenever I don't know something, mm-hmm. I don't care how dumb I look. I ask a whole lot of questions. And that's honestly how I've learned a lot of different things. Like, that's why I have to talk in quiet because... This is a different, like, so growing up Caribbean, like, we're always, like, we, we've always been taught to just go after whatever it is, and nothing can stop you. And that's kind of what I've experienced, but that's also because of how my parents, like, positioned us. Like, being in South Florida, we grew up in this place, place called Davie. It was a white community. Like, that, we, they kind of paved the way for us so we didn't have to experience a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. So I always want to make sure that I understand and I can empathize with how my friends grew up and how other people's different experiences because I can't necessarily speak on it the same way. Mm. You know, so it's kind of hard. Mm. That's why I'm just like, I'm kind of nervous because I don't know what I'm going to say in some some situations. Um, Because the nearest thing that I got to, I guess, racism or like situation like that was my brother when he was working at um, Publix and he was pushing the cart and the young lady was just like, oh, mommy, his hands are dirty. And that's the closest we kind of got to it. Mm. You know, so... It's very interesting hearing the different perspectives that are shared. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of going off topic, but that's kind of what's been going on in my mind. Like, this is this is some real stuff. Like, this is... I think... Yeah. I think if you're going to flip it to a spiritual perspective, you're talking about being a good steward. Mm-hmm. If you only rely on this world system, then that'll be the results that you get. That's cool. um, I believe that if we're going to on a sp- spiritual lane, if y'all will go with me real quick, I believe that God will give each individual wisdom on how to handle their finances. Uh, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, I'm the Lord your God that teaches you to profit. Like we need to be taught how to profit. And if your only teaching is based on this world system or your household, we're saying what the results are that God gave Joseph a vision on how to multiply his resources in years of famine. That saving is not a world system. Mm-hmm. God told Joseph, yo, in these years of famine, take a portion of that to the side and while everybody else starving, y'all gonna be good. You flip that to the New Testament, Jesus himself gave a parable where he said he gave one man one talent, another man five, and another one ten, mm-hmm. which shows me that no matter what situation you in, wisdom can be applied. Story. If you have less, the middle, or upper class, the same wisdom can be applied, and you might not ever have as much as the man with ten talents, but at the same time, you can still maximize your potential in whatever situation you're in. And that parable, the person who had the least, Bible said was lazy and just hit it and didn't trade, didn't invest, didn't multiply his resources. And and Jesus caught that man lazy. So I think if you're if you're dependent on this world system, if you're dependent on the government, if you're dependent on your black family's household to somehow miraculously understand financial literacy and teach it to you, then that's gonna be the fruit that you uh, you know, that's gonna be the tree that you eat off. But mm-hmm. I think God will give each individual wisdom. I think there are practical things in the Bible uh, that can unlock spiritual resources. I think if you tithe, I think if you give to good causes, if you give to the needy, these are things, these are practical things that we think are so spiritual, but they're really simple to do. They're really, really simple things. And I think that people who do these things are generally more successful. And Mm. I, I think that's that's a that's a that's a key part of it that we haven't yet unlocked and we're talking a lot about the world system and the government and racism but i truly believe that god can supersede any system that we're currently living in mm-hmm. um and that as a culture man i don't really want to go all the way here but as a culture i think we're taught in black churches 
to just pray and wait and believe for God to make something happen. But according to the parable what that Jesus... Faith, faith without works is what? But according to the exactly. parable that yeah. Jesus gave, that man who did that was lazy and mm-hmm. slothful. That's yeah. what he called him. Mm-hmm. So I think I think even in our black churches, there's a, 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 a loser's mentality at times. As a culture, even in our churches, we're taught to be the borrower and not the lender. That's and it's right. the complete opposite of what was originally intended. That's right. I was uh, speaking <clears throat> at a HBCU. I won't say the name of the college. Kids came up to me and said, I cannot be financially successful compared to my white friends. Do we feel, as a culture, that African Americans, we can never be as successful financially as a Caucasian individual? That's a horrible way to think. Yeah. I, I don't think anyone on this panel thinks that I think, at all. I think, yeah. I think it's case by case. I have a dream. Um, I think that um, in many, I think if, if we're just being honest, in some instances that is true. In some instances that is not. I think there are... In what instances? If Oprah I think, believed that... Yeah. And that's what I was about to yeah, go to. That, so yeah, that's yeah, what I, that race. was the point. I, I was literally going to that point. Yeah. I think those... Of those of us of our com- community who do break out, who do really understand financial freedom and literacy, I, I think some responsibility has to be put on them to reach back into the community and teach. Uh, it, it, you're, you're not, you're, you're not. Um, the black billionaire is not in competition with the white billionaire. That's mm. not the. That shouldn't be the mindset. The black billionaire mindset should be: How can we make more black billionaires? Yeah. I also, to the point of education, and I'm sorry, T, but to the point of education, I'm at the point now where I'm really considering the same 200 grand that I'm going in debt for to get them a degree where they can't even get a $60,000 job. What could they do in four years if I invested $50,000 into their business? I could tell. What could they be? What, what could they be in four years? And I, that's a that's a mentality shift. That's a mentality shift because are we really getting the tools that we need from the education system? I went to college. I got two degrees. I personally think if I would have started a business at 18 instead of going to college at 18, that I could I would be more successful today than I am. And I think that might be a mentality, a mentality shift. It might take breaking out of cultural systems. It might take trying something new to actually see some different fruit and yield some different fruit. Because you, we all know the statistics on college graduates who can't get jobs. Correct. We all know the statistic. It's an epidemic at this point. Yeah. So, that might be one of the sorry T. That might be one of the big. <laughs> that might be one of the the college. College might be one of the biggest hustles in the country. I right can now. speak the truth for personal experience. Sorry T. My daughter, <laughs> my daughter was going to Pepperdine, right Malibu. Ooh. 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 Too much money for me to Ooh. ever think I could pay for it, right? Ooh. But she got a little scholarship. She went there, but obviously scholarship to take care of everything. You know, after two years, she wanted to come back home, and me and my wife was like, Yeah, come on, let's go. Take put in a community college. And she said, you know what? I want to be an entrepreneur just like you guys. Mm. I was like, at first, in my mind, you know, even though I was taught to be an entrepreneur, no, babe, you got to get the education. Mm-hmm. Then after her telling me, Dad, no, I want to do this. I want to be an entrepreneur. And we made a, a decision, a fiscal decision, to say, put that college on the side. When she was 18, she's 21 now, and she's doing $100,000 a year in her own business. Mm. And I look back now like, Man, come on, man. Why, you know, I should have listened to her earlier, you know, but that's, the, I, I'm true in understanding of what, you know, what you're talking about, because I, I wholeheartedly believe that. And I came I from one of them households. Yeah. It was like, you going to college, yeah. you going to get, that's, it, it was, it was predetermined. No more than You're death. going to college, you're going to get your degree, and there was no plan for after I got my degree. And I said, if you want to go back to school, and she's going back part-time just to get a degree, go back. But right now, hustle. Get your business started. She's been doing it successfully for two years. So I truly understand that. So uh, I'm, I'm close to that. I ain't there yet, but I'm yeah, close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know. I heard you say something. Uh, I'm curious. And, yeah. and, and you may not agree with me. That's cool. Keep it 100. This is about y'all. <laughs> I hate debt. I hate it like I hate candy yams. I just hate debt. Candy well, yams. I hate candy yams. <laughs> No marshmallows, nothing. But I, I, I gotta ask this question, man. I gotta ask this question because I keep hearing this. Ta said it earlier. Uh, our African American students are getting out, taking out student loans to go to college, maxing it out. I hear you talk about two hundred thousand dollars in debt, get into college. I hear you talking about your daughter went off to college, got the education, but uh, scholarships didn't take care of all of it. 
can we as a culture mm -hmm. go to school without racking up debt? You say can, can we? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You say can, can we? Yes. yes. Can we be successful without racking up debt? Because I ask this question because when I hear HBCUs, studies are showing that 10 years after the average person, white person graduates, they owe 65% of their student loan. 10 years. Dive deep. People who look like us, 10 years after they graduate, they owe 113%. They have the education, they have the degree, but we owe 113%. Because we don't have the education. What do you mean? Listen, I have my degree. Mm -hmm. I want my children to get their degrees. Mm -hmm. I sit on the board of colleges here. It's very important to me to have an education. Right. But what to to what are you being educated? Mm -hmm. We don't have that information, and we don't want to hear that information that says, I'm going to live like no one else mm -hmm. so that later I can live like no one else. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to go and talk to somebody else. I'm going to get the information that I need to get in collaboration with, as you said, with God's children. Mm. God's kingdom doesn't have one color on That's it. That's right. And I think that when we when we get that education from other people who have that experience, like you said earlier, there has been such a wealth of knowledge that has been put out here on the table today, which I think all points back to, we can't do any of this stuff by ourselves. Mm -hmm. No. As we think about Black History Month, all that we've uh, gone through as a culture, where we currently are as a culture, and where we're going in the future, what is one thing you want the people to remember from you? Hmm. I would say, I've been thinking about this the whole time. <laughs> I would say we've got to learn how to give, hmm. learn how to submit, and learn how to pray for each other. I think when you do those things, doors open for you. Large doors and opportunities open for those that are willing to give and sacrifice and open their hands up and not be so tight. Yeah. This is mine, this is my. Be fruitful and multiply and give because I can tell you from my own personal experiences that the more that I've given, the more that I've received in terms of peace, and just uh, just doors opening for me in different ways that I could never have thought imaginable. Wow. And so I think we got to get out of this mindset of like, all right, like how much can I rack up in this lifetime? It's not about that. Like how much can you give yeah. in this lifetime? Love it. So what I, what I would think is, so in the, in the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. The biggest line that always stands out to me is we cannot walk alone. Meaning, we need help from everyone. We, so we talked about this whole night, how, how black people can help each other. But like I said, we're only 15% of this nation. And so that means there's 75% of people that influence everything. And we need their influence to change, to help change the narrative about black people and how far we can keep advancing. So that, that's the biggest thing. We can't walk alone. And we need the, we need the good people from every race to, to help us fight our fight and keep going on. Um, I totally believe in racism. I think um, systemic racism is the greatest form. I think it's alive and well and vibrant, um, especially over the past three years. Um, I think classism is bigger than racism and equally mm -hmm. <laughs> destructive. Um, I think I think all of these things are real. Um, so my takeaway message, not to any other race, um, I don't think we even stand in a place to give them instructions. I don't think, I think even when it comes down to white privilege, I don't think white people take white privilege. I think it's given to them and they don't give it back. I think they can't, you know, it's not something they're taking. It's not something they're asking for. It's given to them. And it's, that's not their fault. Um, so not addressing any other race, just addressing our own people. I think because classism and racism and all these things exist, I would tell other people that look like me, other black and brown people, don't prove them right. Mm. That's my only message. I think I don't have children yet, um, but when I have children, that's going to be my message to my children. You don't prove them right. 
You can't alter what anyone thinks of you. You can't alter, you could, you know, try to do everything right and people are still going to have an opinion of you. You can't change that. But what you can do is not prove them right. And I think um, I work at a HBCU, so I see thousands of um, Black young people every single day. And I take a personal responsibility to pull them to the side one at a time if I have to and say, don't prove them right. Mm. You know, don't be in a certain place acting a certain way and prove them right. Mm -hmm. Don't don't make this mistake. Don't follow this path. You know, I worry about our students when they go home for Christmas. Because wow. there's somebody in the neighborhood that's jealous that you're going to school. Wow. And they might want to just ruin that for you yeah. because they're angry that they didn't have the same opportunity. Don't prove them right and be out there and give them a reason, you know? And, and it, it sounds like it's um, kind of conditioning as a, as a reaction to post-traumatic stress. Um, but I, I think that's just uh, my personal view on it. If we don't prove the people that think the worst of us right, we'll get a, at least an inch ahead. I think um, we need to show a little more compassion for each other. Our brothers and sisters, if we're talking about our community, willing have more willingness to listen to each other, right? Not all of us are in certain positions in life, but listen to each other's plight. You know, you can learn something from somebody who doesn't have as much as you. You can teach them vice yeah. versa. Right. You know, um, I think um, not allowing the blood that's been spilled on this United States of America from your ancestors go in vain. Mm -hmm. right? Do everything you can. Educate yourself. Learn. Reach out to mentors. Make phone calls. Do what you got to do if that's what you want to do and become more successful or change the situation. Got to go after it. You know, time doesn't stop. You know, but our history is still there behind us, right? But just formulate a way to teach each other. Teach each other. There's got to be a way to teach each other. Teach the babies the right way. You know, be that symbol of hope, be that beacon of hope. Um, that's it. I can sum up uh, my final thought to this whole thing in a simple verse, Bible verse. Uh, don't lay up treasures on earth mm -hmm. where moths and rust corrupt, but lay up treasures in heaven. Um, my main message would be that even though all of these issues that we've discussed today are real, and are valid, this life is but a vapor. Mm -hmm. And in the grand scheme of things, uh, nothing we talk about will go, into, go with us into eternity. I would say invest in eternal life. Like my man was saying, invest in your inner uh, security and your self-esteem and your self-worth and producing fruit of the spirit and peace and joy and love. Those are the things that um, are never gonna die. Those are the things that are eternal. And um, whether Jordans and Benzes or businesses and degrees, <clears throat> moth and rust corrupt all of these things. So don't even focus. Don't make don't make stockpiling treasures on earth your priority ever. Mm. She wanna say, Mom, you've been quiet. Oh, this was also great. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing <clears throat> that I would say is um, tying back to me. You're talking about reading. Mm -hmm. Just the power of renewing your mind, like regardless of what anyone has ever experienced or went through, there's so much power in when we're just renewing our mind with truth, or at least the, what's the, like the areas that may feel like it's lacking to invest in that. Because whatever you and like, your actions are a reflection of your belief system. So whatever you're believing is eventually going to show out in your actions, but it's going to become your life. So if you continue to renew your mind with truth or invest in the areas that are lacking. All of a sudden, like, as your belief system changes, it'll make a difference in your actions. And then also being careful what you're speaking, because whatever you continue to speak over and over and over is going to be what you start to believe, and then it's going to affect. So all that ties in together. So being very careful what you're saying out of your mouth to yourself, saying out of your mouth to other people around you, and then surrounding yourself with people that are going to speak into the areas that you may not see that may be dead mm. so that you can come to life. Like you're talking about like how you connect with different people that basically don't do what you do so you can get better and become well-rounded as a person. Um, that's what I would say. Just invest in yourself so that you can be there for other people. Piggybacking off of that and going back to what Christian said, if we end it um, the way that we began it, in the beginning was the word. Mm. And the word was God, and the word was with God. 
which lets us know that everything is circulating around words. I am the result of the words my father said to my mother. Mm. And I think that we have to be careful. There was a song when I was a little girl, oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. And I think that was so key, what you what you just finished saying, um, Simone, is that one of the things that I teach my team and that I teach my children is speak what you seek till you see what you've said. And I think that's the greatest investment that I could have ever made in them is that power of life and death lie in our tongue. But more than anything, if I could give a thought to end what I've heard each and every one of you say is that work is required of us. Mm -hmm. That to whom a lot is given, a lot is required in exchange. That you don't get to sit in this chair without having done something. Mm -hmm. You don't get to come to the table and get to be a part of the conversation without having done something. That's right. That work is required of you. And we expect to have great and amazing things while being mediocre. Mm -hmm. And mediocrity doesn't get you the kind of life that people write stories about. Mediocrity doesn't get you Mercedes Benzes that are not attached to can't sleep at night with an inability to pay for them or even Jordan tennis shoes. And so I think the biggest thing for me that I would hope that anybody knew is that you've got to put in the work. When you hear this last thing, one word, when you hear this, what is one word that comes to mind? One word. When you hear this, black people. Resilient. Powerful. Beautiful. Persistent. Legendary. Wow. Me. <laughs> Able. Mm. Equip. How mm. still going? Caring. God damn Rick. I I just keep thinking about just the, the resiliency, but just think about all that we've overcome just uh in the since the last four hundred years just in America, um slavery, Jim Crow laws, everything under the sun, and we, we still bounce back. And like you said, we're still the, the heartbeat of America. Uh, we're pop culture. The, the rappers are the, new, are the new rock stars. Our athletes are the ones that are on the face of every of every sport, including golf. So I always just think, man, and that's the thing I take the most pride in, just how resilient it is, how resilient we are. And no matter like how many times we get knocked down or counted out, we get right back up and we keep punching. And that that's something I, I take a great deal of pride in. I think with all the differences in, in opinion here that tonight, it's uh, it's amazing how we can still circle back and just be proud of the people that we are. Yeah. 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 And I hope that's something individually and collectively that we never lose. That's like, right. I've never felt um, sad that I was a black person. Oh, I've never no. wanted never to be anything oh, else. No. I'm yeah. happy about it. I'm that's proud right. of it. And I, I hope collectively as a body, we always will be. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well said. Such a deep uh, and intellectual conversation tonight from dear friends of mine. And uh, when you think of um, black people, I'm curious to know what is one word. I want you to type that below and let me know uh, what is your thoughts. Uh, but if you watched all four uh, parts of this, uh, thank you so much. I'm curious to know uh, what did you think about this? Um, do you want to see this again next year? What are some more questions maybe I can follow up and answer as well? Uh, but thank you again so much for just watching and dialoguing with me and with all of us, honestly, here. So I'll see you in the next video. You know what time it is. It's your boy, A.O., and I'm going to see you on the next video. Peace out.